celebrate Freedom Week. And it's because education is so lousy in states on these documents that they now require by state law an entire week to be spent out of every year in grades 3 through 12 on the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration, studying the original intent, the founders, the ones behind it. So we're now, we're now coming back in a number of states with some emphasis on this. But these immutable principles, let me take you through them real quickly first. All men are created equal. They're endowed by the Creator. The first thing we get there is there is a divine Creator. Now, here's where the debate comes because the courts today say, well, that's okay for you to believe, but you can't do that in the public arena. Public arena has to be neutral between religion and non-religion. You can't have preference one way. No, this is a government document. It's the unanimous declaration of 13 United States of America. Down here they say it's the representatives of Congress assembled. This is not a private declaration. This is a public official declaration. That's the first point we make from our birth is we officially believe government has a role in promoting God. As a matter of fact, George Washington, uh, when he became president, he issued the first national proclamation calling people to call on God. We, we've been blessed to have about 100,000 original documents, so I own thousands of Washington's handwritten documents, etc. But we have the original proclamation that he did, and this is that proclamation, 17th of October, 1789. Now, why in the world would God call the entire, why in the world would Washington call the entire nation to remember God? He said right here. He said, where is this the duty? And let me just show you the quote. He says, because it's the duty, and I'll emphasize the word duty. The word duty in the dictionaries in their day meant a legally binding contractual obligation. That's why in Texas we always did things in handshake. I built houses for years, never signed a piece of paper with a bank, ran hundreds of thousands of dollars through there. We always shook hands. And that, that was a legally binding contractual obligation. In, eight, in 1913, they changed the definition of duty to that which is a responsibility. And the current definition of duty says that which one ought to do. Well, there's a heck of a lot of difference between what you ought to do and a legally binding contractual obligation. Washington says it's a legally binding contractual obligation of nations. He doesn't say individuals. He says national political entities have a legally binding contractual obligation to do four things. Look at the verse. Duty of nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. That's the duty of nations. That's a legally binding contractual obligation. That means government is not neutral in the position of God. That's the first position that we had in our declaration. And now we backed off and said, no, you got to not. There, there's some people who don't believe in God. You can't offend them. Uh, no, this is what, and, and the reason that, that it all stems from this is because the second point that we have in the Declaration is that they're endowed by their free or certain inalienable rights. Now, we believe that there is a God and that God gives a certain set of rights. Rights can come from only two sources, social compact rights which come from man or rights that come from God. We call them inalienable rights. Now, today, I run across folks all the time who believe this, but who cannot define an inalienable right. So let me take you through a quick definition. Inalienable right defined by the guys who wrote the documents is very simple. John Dickinson not only helped with the Declaration, he went on to sign the Constitution. Dickinson said, an inalienable right is a right which God gave you, and which no inferior power has a right to take away. In other words, two classes of rights. There's the ones that come from man. If man gives them to you, and man can regulate, alter them, change them, or take them away. There's another set of rights that are higher than man. They come from God, and they cannot be touched by any inferior power, which is civil government. You also have Alexander Hamilton, who not only was the signer of the Constitution, did the Federalist Papers. I love this definition. He said, an inalienable right are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. These aren't the things that you find given by government. He says, they're written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the aid of divinity itself, and can never be erased or obscured by any world power. So an enable right is a right that is not in government documents, it's in God's documents. The next thing you have is the definition of John Adams. He says, inalienable rights are antecedent to all earthly government, and they cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws or rights derived from the great legislative universe. Here's the big phrase. They're antecedent to all earthly government. What's the first earthly government in history? It's Noah. When Noah got off the ark, God gave him what are called the Noahide Law, seven categories of civil laws, Prior to that, there was no civil government. That's the first civil government in the history of the world. So, he says, enable rights, the rights are antecedent to earthly government. In other words, first civil government starts in Genesis 9. Enable rights are those that you find in Genesis 1 through 8 before government ever existed. Now, the founding fathers have a lot of writings on Genesis 1 through 8. I'm not going to go into them, but just be aware that they're rights that came before government came into existence. They're God-given rights. Now, with that, when you say what are specifically the, those rights, well, those who wrote the Declaration, like Sam Adams, the father of the Revolution, he said, well, among others, we told you in the Declaration that among others, there was first a right to life, secondly to liberty, thirdly to property. 
that 11 years later when they completed the, the revolution, we had a constitution, we said now let's go back and enshrine some of those other inalienable rights that are above government, the government can't touch. That's where we did the Bill of Rights. You have the First Amendment right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. That's a God-given right, not a government-given right. Second Amendment right to defend yourself, what they call the biblical right of self-defense, the right to keep and bear arms. Third Amendment right to the sanctity of the home. The government cannot mess with the sanctity of the home, marriage, or anything else. Fourth Amendment right on justice, due process. Fifth Amendment right on private property protection. I mean, all these are inalienable rights. They go all the way through. So that's inalienable rights. That's the second thing we believe in government is there is a creator. He gives a certain set of rights that government's not allowed to mess with. They can't touch. They, they can't do anything with. The third point is that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now we get, the, we get the primary object of government. Government exists to protect inalienable rights. It does not exist for economy. It does not exist for stability. It does not exist to make sure everybody's got a job. It exists that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Among men. A lot of founders said that. James Wilson, one of only six guys who signed the Declaration and the Constitution, He's the, he, wrote, he started the original law schools in America. George Washington put him on the Supreme Court as an original justice. We have his original law books. He says, the principal object of government is to acquire a new security for the enjoyment of those rights which were previously entitled by the immediate gift of our all wise, all beneficent creator. Go back to Genesis 1 through 8. God gave the right to life in Genesis 1 through 8. Cain violated the right to life. Cain took the life of someone else in shedding of innocent blood, not supposed to do it. God handled that situation. But it became so prevalent throughout the rest of, of the history of Genesis 1 through 8 that murder was everywhere, and God says, okay, I'm wiping this out, I'm starting again. So when he institutes civil government in Genesis 1 9, the first command of the seven Noahide laws he gives Noah is very simple. Noah, Genesis 9 6, whoever sheds a man's blood, by him will man's blood be shed. I gave you an inalienable right to life. Here's the deal government is to take out anybody that violates that right to life. If you will not protect that, that's the role of government, is to get it out so that we can protect the right to life. You look at all seven of the Noahide laws, they're all guaranteed to protect inalienable rights that have been violated by mankind over Genesis 1 through 8. So government's created, it's instituted to protect the inalienable rights that you have in Genesis 1 through 8. Sam Adams said the same thing. He said, government was originally designed for the preservation of the inalienable rights. That's where Genesis 9 government came from, to preserve the inalienable rights that have been violated. He said, first, the right to life, secondly, liberty, thirdly, the property. Now, I want to focus on this for a minute because he says first is a right to lie. In this day and culture, we think, boy, wouldn't it have really been cool to found involved and talk about abortion because that would help us in our abortion cases, argue original intent. You know, obviously that was not an issue for those guys, and why do we say that? Genesis, Ecclesiastes 1 9 says there's nothing new under the sun. As long as there were people who were pregnant, there were people who didn't want to be pregnant. The only thing that's changed over time is not abortion, it's simply the technology that deals with it. Matter that's of fact, right. here's a book we have in our library on abortion in America, 1808. Right. This mm -hmm. was a discussion, a big debate back there when they said first is a right to life. It definitely included abortion. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, if you go into James Wilson's legal writings, he talks about abortion. This is what he tells students. That, and again, the guy who did our Constitution, he's called the master builder of the Constitution. This is what he said. With consistency, beautiful and undeviating, human life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. He said, in the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb and by the law that life is protected. And how is it protected? He said, by the common law. See, abortion was a Seventh Amendment issue. Common law is the Seventh Amendment. We argued it under the Ninth and Fourteenth Amendments of the Supreme Court. It was a Seventh Amendment issue all the way. Founding Fathers talked very openly about it. He said, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb. Here's where technology comes in. How long did it take back then to know for sure you had life in the womb? Two, three months. Now we know within six days of fertilization. The point is, as soon as you know there's life in the womb, by the law that life is protected. Now other founders talked about this very openly. Uh, for example, you have John Witherspoon signed with the Declaration. He said, the difference between us and Europe is in Europe they let you do abortions. We don't do that in America. He said, the reason is, he says in Europe they have this strange notion that parents create life. He said, we know that God creates life. It's not parents that create life, it's God that creates life. He said, that's why in Europe they think that God doesn't exist. They think that parents create life, therefore they let you do abortions. Not in America. He says, a perfect right in the state of natural liberty is the right to life. He says, in America, we've denied the power of life and death to parents. We don't do what they do in Europe. We don't do abortions. Over there, they think that God doesn't give life. Over here, we know that life is an inalienable right. It's the purpose of government to protect that right. Now, when you take, all, and I can show you others as well, Thomas Jefferson, what they did in Virginia on anti-abortion laws. When you take first, is, and this is what I want to emphasize, this comes in a political application in, in a way that's very cogent to me. I hope 
political office in Texas for nine years, very involved with political folks. There's probably 120 members of Congress I consider to be very good friends, talk with them very regularly. I have learned that if I can find out first where any candidate or any incumbent is on the life issue, if I can find out where they're on the life issue with a 90% degree of certainty, I will tell you how they will vote on every other issue. If I know where they are on life, I will tell you what they did on TARP, I'll tell you what they did on stimulus, I will tell you where they are on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I'll tell you where they are on the Small Arms Treaty. You tell me where they are on life with a 90% degree of certainty, I'll tell you everything else because if you will not protect the first of the inalienable rights, you don't do a good job of protecting the second, third, fourth, fifth. That's why people who are wrong in the life issue are also wrong in the First Amendment right to worship God according to the United States Society. Whoa, you can't say God in graduation. What are you thinking about? If you're wrong in the life issue, you'll be wrong in the right, right to publicly acknowledge God. You'll be wrong Amen. in Hobby Lobby. You'll be wrong in Conestoga Wagons. You'll be wrong in Obamacare conscience protection. If you're wrong in the life, you'll be wrong on conscience and religious expression. If you're wrong in the life issue, you'll be wrong in the Second Amendment to defend yourself, the biblical right of self-defense. Interesting, those that are pro-abortion are also for gun control. If you're wrong in the life issue, you'll be wrong in the Third Amendment issue of sanctity of home. Those that are wrong in the life amendment are also wrong with the traditional marriage amendment, the traditional marriage issue. The two things go hand in hand. If you're wrong in the life issue, you'll be wrong in the Fifth Amendment right to protect private property. You'll believe like the Supreme Court does that Kelo is the right position, that the government that property belongs to the government. If you don't do something good with it, we can take it away from you and give it to somebody else. Or if we need your your piece of property for something, we can take it because it belongs to us. That's why you pay property taxes to us. It's not your property. See, you get that mentality, and it all goes back. If you're wrong in life, it should be wrong with every one of these other issues. Now, we are told that these are social issues and that voters today don't care about social issues.